just as George W. Bush betrayed his foolish followers, so must Obama, because his only allegiance is to his offshore masters. President Obama today nominated Ben Bernanke for a second four-year term as Federal Reserve Chairman. The president called his actions on the global financial crisis bold and out of the box. As an expert on the causes of the Great Depression, I'm sure Ben never imagined that he would be part of a team responsible for preventing another. But because of his background, his temperament, his courage, and his creativity, that's exactly what he has helped to, to achieve. And that is why I am reappointing him to another term as chairman of the Federal Reserve. So Obama has made it quite clear by his actions, never mind his words, his actions as to who owns him, who, who he works for, and who he serves. And it's not the American people. It is so obvious to anyone paying attention that the President of the United States is not the real person in control. Whether it is Gerald Ford or Jimmy Carter or Ronald Reagan or, or Clinton or Bush or Bush, Obama is no different. And to think that he is an independent figure is just crazy. And as Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, Presidents are selected, they are not elected. Obama pledged that he would end NAFTA and GATT and has since fought to expand both of them. Obama promised that he would have the most transparent administration ever and he is already more secretive than Bush and Cheney ever were, even making it a secret who visits the White House. I can make a firm pledge. If your family earns less than $250,000 a year, if you make less than a quarter million dollars a year, if you are a family making two, less than $250,000 a year, you will not see your taxes increased a single dime. You will not see your taxes go up. You will not see your taxes increase one single dime. Not your capital gains tax, not your payroll tax, not your income tax, no tax. Not your income tax, not your payroll tax, not your capital gains taxes, not any of your taxes. Not your payroll tax, not your capital gains tax, not your income tax, no tax. Your taxes will not go up because the last thing you need is higher taxes when we're in a recession like this and you won't get one under an Obama administration. Obama made the centerpiece of his campaign the pledge that taxes would not be raised on anyone making under $125,000 a year. He has since gone back on that promise as well and has proposed new taxes on payroll, energy, home mortgage deductions, and scores of other taxes. He made a pledge. He said, I'm not going to raise taxes on anyone making under $250,000. Mm -hmm. Is that pledge still active? Uh, we are going to let the process work its way through it. So it's not. So it's not. So it's not. We're going to let the process <laughs> work its way through. All right. The Senate uh, is looking, especially at this issue of, of capping the deductions uh, for, for health care that employers and employees uh, now get. That would, <coughs> it would be a incre tax increase for many families earning under $250,000. But the president said he was open to it. So that means that the tax pledge he made back in September is no longer operative? Obama said he was going to abolish the Patriot Act. He now vigorously defends it. We saw the same type of flip-flop when it came to warrantless wiretapping of the American people. Look what Obama's done with wiretapping, surveillance. He's brought it to heights even beyond what George Bush, the disgusting levels that he brought it to. So we have more surveillance. Now they're talking about what is it called? Cybercom, the new Pentagon secret cyber society that's going to be watching over us to get those terrorists. We got to get those terrorists. So now they'll be invading our privacy even more. So, I mean, it really, it really almost makes you ask the question would it have been better if we never invented the internet? and had to use paper and pencil or whatever. Now Obama is setting up the Cybersecurity Command, which the government admits completely ends the Fourth Amendment and allows President Obama to shut off the Internet in the United States whenever he wishes. Indeed, in today's world, acts of terror could come not only from a few extremists in suicide vests, but from a few keystrokes on the computer, a weapon of mass disruption. As part of the new single national security staff announced this week, 
I'm creating a new office here at the White House that will be led by the cybersecurity coordinator. This new control grid is administered by the Pentagon. They just want to keep tabs on us. So we're turning in to a surveillance wiretapped government state. The government is taking more and more control over our lives. I can stand here today as President of the United States and say without exception or equivocation that we do not torture. Obama made a show of investigating torture, but has ignored the Army's own detailed investigative reports, which name the tortures that the White House memos document were following the directives of Bush and Cheney, the men who are most guilty for issuing the infamous orders. Some low-level soldiers have been prosecuted for their role at Abu Ghraib, but no senior officer has been held accountable in any of these cases to date. Heidi? I know that these debates lead directly, in some cases, to a call for a fuller accounting, perhaps through an independent commission. Now, I've opposed the creation of such a commission. Next, Obama expanded Bush's doctrine of indefinite detention of foreigners without trial to holding citizens without evidence indefinitely, without ever even committing a crime. President Obama today proposed something new, something called prolonged detention. Pre-crime is where people are arrested and incarcerated to prevent crimes that they have not yet committed. Barack H. Obama, who ran as an anti-war candidate, has continued the war in Iraq, massively expanded the war in Afghanistan, and unleashed a new conflict in Pakistan. Now Obama is promoting the biggest defense budget in history, dwarfing George Bush's war machine. What George Bush has been trying to do as part of his effort to accumulate more power in the presidency is he's been saying, well, I can basically change what Congress passed by attaching a letter saying, I don't agree with this part or I don't agree with that part. I'm going to choose to interpret it this way or that way. Uh, that's not part of his power. But this is part of the whole theory of George Bush that he can make laws as he's going along. Uh, I disagree with that. I taught the Constitution for 10 years. I believe in the Constitution and I will obey the Constitution of the United States. We're not going to use signing statements as a way of doing an end run around Congress. All right? Obama guaranteed that once president, he would stop the unconstitutional practice of issuing signing statements through which the executive branch illegally usurps the legislative power of Congress. Congressman Kucinich, when he introduced his uh, 60 uh, uh, articles of impeachment against Bush uh, Jr., I think one was the signing statements. The form of the resolution is as follows. A resolution, articles of impeachment, of George Bush, President of the United States, resolved that President George W. Bush be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors, Article 26, announcing the intent to violate laws with signing statements and in violation of his constitutional duty under Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution to take care that the laws be faithfully executed has used signing statements to claim the right to violate acts of Congress even before he signs those acts into law. Same analysis would uh, uh, apply uh, to Obama and a fortiori because he taught constitutional law. He knows better. He's a lawyer licensed to practice law, who, as I am, who took an oath when he was licensed to uphold the Constitution and laws of the United States of America. With his signature on the spending bill also came Obama's first signing statement, a presidential declaration freeing him from following some of the bill's contents. I believe in the Constitution and I will obey the Constitution of the United States. We're not going to use signing statements as a way of doing an end run around Congress. All right? He also promised that he would call on Congress to take at least five days to read new legislation before it was voted on. When there's a bill that ends up on my desk as president, you, the public, will have five days to look online 
and find out what's in it before I sign it. So that you know what your government's doing. But from his first day in power, he has aggressively pressured Congress to quickly pass bills before lawmakers and the public even have a chance to see them. We'll state his parliamentary inquiry. Uh, speaker, in order to try to figure out what we're doing, how much damage the country, I try to get a copy of the bill. We have out here on the table 2454 that has 1,090 pages in it, but I've understood since debate in here that there's another 300 pages that were added in the middle of the night. My inquiry is, how do I get a copy of the other 300 pages that people on here, on here uh, or here on the floor that I hadn't had a chance to read or see? Where, where do we get that before we slam this, cram this down on the American people? Is there somewhere physically in the House of Representatives a copy of what we're voting on? The gentleman has not stated a parliamentary inquiry that the, that the chair can answer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have to say that I am outraged. Here we are getting ready to vote on a piece of legislation, and we haven't even seen 300 pieces of this legislation. No one can even find the bill or even knows where it's at. Obama swore that he would never put lobbyists or donors in his administration. Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner appointed Mark Patterson, and this is a former top lobbyist for Goldman Sachs, as his chief of staff. And then last week there was a lot of buzz over William Lynn. He was the, appointed to the number two position at the Defense Department. William Lynn, also a former top lobbyist for Raytheon, which is a, uh, a, one of the five largest defense contractors. He has now broken all previous records by cramming his administration full of contributors and lobbyists who openly write legislation being proposed by the White House. There's a good reason Obama doesn't want to give the people or Congress any time to read the bills. I'm still needing a copy of the other 300 mysterious pages that we don't get to see here. Shortly after the 2008 election, Vice President Joe Biden confided to top supporters that it was essential that their program be implemented at lightning speed. Because their agenda was so unpopular, they knew Obama would lose support quickly. Obama's handlers were in a race to pass a raft of legislation before the people discovered that Obama was just a slicker, updated version of previous puppets. Obama is the New World Order's closer. It's his job to repackage and solidify the tyrannical policies of George W. Bush as progressive and trendy. So part of my job, I think, as president is to make government cool again. Chris Hedges, author of Empire of Illusion, explained it succinctly. President Obama does one thing, and brand Obama gets you to believe another. This is the essence of successful advertising. You buy or do what the advertiser wants because of how they make you feel. Through Obama, the global establishment are now putting their entire program into high gear. Obama is attempting to dismantle the Second Amendment with more than a dozen victim disarmament bills now in Congress. The key is going to be, I think, for us to come together and say people do have an individual right and there's nothing wrong with common sense gun laws. Hate crime and cyberbullying bills in the House and Senate would effectively criminalize free speech protected under the First Amendment. It is absolutely true that NAFTA was a mistake. A senior member of the Obama campaign called the Canadian government within the last month to say that when Senator Obama talks about opting out of the free trade deal, the Canadian government shouldn't worry. The operative said it's just campaign rhetoric and don't take it seriously. <laughs> This, uh, the Canadian government put out a statement indicating that this was just not true. So I don't know who the sources. It wasn't true. Amid all of the denials, sources at the highest level of the Canadian government who first confirmed that a call was made, late this afternoon, reconfirmed that a call was made. President Obama is promoting the creation of a North American Union and is attempting to expand NAFTA and GATT. President Obama is pushing nation-ending blanket amnesty for more than 20 million foreign aliens living illegally inside the United States. He's also overseeing the hijacking of health care by the federal government, which will nationalize more than 20 percent of the U.S. economy. And you want us to believe that a government that can't even run a cash for clunkers
workers program is going to run one seventh of our U.S. economy. No, sir. No. Obama is continuing the transfer of national sovereignty to unelected international bodies like the United Nations and World Trade Organization. And most important of all, under the cover of banking reform, Obama wants to hand dictatorial power over the United States economy to an offshore private banking cartel known as the Bank of the World. Richard, what happened to all those threats from France's president about storming out and, and, and about having a global regulator uh, who was going to reach across borders and be able to, 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 to deal with markets no matter what country they were in? They have opened up the idea of there being some form of other regulator across countries, and I think that's going to come So back. is this some sort of new world order, which, which Gordon oh, wow. Brown kind of alluded to? I think the new world order is emerging, and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. The finance heads of the 20 industrialized nations met again in late September of 2009 at the G20 summit in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. At that meeting, ministers called for an end to the dollar as the world reserve currency. They also called for a strengthening of global governance and called for a new world order. While the bankers were busy carving up the world at the G20 summit, Barack Obama was in New York City at the United Nations because he's got a new job to chair the United Nations Security Council, the most powerful position in the world government body. President Obama does what no other U.S. president ever has. As President Obama presided over the U.N.'s most powerful body. That would be the Security Council. Six thousand one hundred and ninety first meeting of the Security Council. For a couple of hours, you could say Mr. Obama was yes, president yes, of the I world. Believe. It is the story of a world that understands that no difference or division is worth destroying all that we have built. In my own country, it has brought Democrats and Republican leaders together. Uh, leaders like George Shultz, Bill Perry, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn, who are with us here today. Barack Obama is the first president to hold two posts simultaneously. And there's a good reason for that. It's illegal. Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution forbids any U.S. president from serving any foreign government or institution. He swears an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. But now Barack Obama has sworn allegiance to the global government and the United Nations that he heads up. Let that sink in real good. Barack Obama now heads the United Nations Security Council. You cannot serve two masters, and Obama isn't. He's selling out the last vestiges of sovereignty that this country had. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the destruction of our nation, and it's also high treason.